remain standing for the reading of the word this morning, Romans 13, verses 11 through 14. The Apostle Paul writes this, he says, This is all the more urgent, for you know how late it is. Time is running out. Wake up, for our salvation is nearer now than we first believed. The night is almost gone. The day of salvation will soon be here. So remove your dark deeds like dirty clothes and put on the shining armor of right living. Because we belong to the day, we must live decent lives for all to see. Don't participate in the darkness of wild parties and drunkenness or in sexual promiscuity and moral living or in quarreling and jealousy. Instead, clothe yourself with the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ and don't let yourself Think about the ways to indulge your evil desires. That concludes the reading of God's word this morning. You may be seated. Thank you so much. Well, good morning, New City. Good morning. Welcome. Thank you so much for being here. My name is Travis. If you are new or haven't met you yet, thank you so much for being here with us. It really does mean a lot to us. We take extreme value in what we get to do every Sunday in coming together and gathering together for fellowship, for worship, through song and opening God's word. And the apostle or uh, and the author of Hebrews tells us that we should never forsake the gathering of the brethren. We should never forsake doing this. It is vital and it's important and it's good. It's, it's part of our preparation as we go into the week ahead of us. So hear that from us. Your presence here is of, of nothing short of extreme value. And we hope that this time this morning will be one of encouragement for you, a time of connection, a time of empowerment, as I said, before we, we begin a new week tomorrow. As you heard, we are beginning, we are continuing in our series, The Pure Gospel, part two in the book of Romans. We're in part two, but we're in section three, if you will, where we, we've kind of made the change. We've, we, we've moved into what is now called the, maybe the applicational or the so what portions of the book of Romans. If you've been with us or if you've gone through the book of Romans before, you'll remember that that chapters 1 through 11 are, one, they're just absolutely amazing. And saying they're, they're filled with some of the richest theology that the Bible has to offer. It's Paul's kind of expounding upon what is the gospel message. He takes the good news of Jesus, and he says, and let, he goes, let me put it in my own kind of words and for us to consider and shoot through. It's an amazing set of chapters. But when we get to chapter 12, we, we're met with this kind of big transition statement. Paul kind of literally turns the page, and he says, okay, now here's what you're going to do with it. Here's what all of this means for you. And, and we, if you were with us a few weeks ago, we, we introduced this phrase, this, this verse, Romans 12, verses 1 and 2, where the Apostle Paul says, therefore, by the renewing of your mind... Right? As, as those who have trusted in Christ, something has taken, there is a transformation, so there's a new being in us. He says, take that transformed, renewed mind, and he says, we are to become holy and living sacrifices, which is a profound phrase in and of itself. But that's where we are even today. Now, weeks later, is this applicational section of Romans, it really just continues to expound upon that very phrase, Become holy living sacrifices. And, and we've been exploring that. We're going to continue doing that today. And, and I want us to consider how do we continue? How do we become a living sacrifice? Last week, if you were with us, Pastor Nick was here. And you, if you recall in verses 8 through 10, one of those things that, that results of us becoming holy living sacrifices is there's, we're called to this obligation of love. Through Christ, we have been set free from so many things. We are now called to pursue the law of Christ, as it's called. And, and there's so much freedom in that, and yet Paul reminds me, he says, but we do have one obligation. There is one thing that is not a choice. We, we have to pursue it, and it's love. He says to, to follow Christ, to be holy living sacrifices, we have to pursue love. We are obliged not only to love our Heavenly Father, not only love the person of Jesus Christ, but he says we are obliged. There is an obligation for us as the body of Christians to love others as well. And today we're going to see, though, we're going to continue on seeing how the transformed mind works and how it becomes a holy and living sacrifice. But here's what I want to preface for today. In the verses that you've already read, in order to do this, we have to be strong. 
if you truly are going to become someone who has the transformed mind, if you truly want to be that person that, be, that takes everything about them, takes their, their, our entire being, our day, everything about us and say, this God, is, I want to be a holy living sacrifice for you, we have to be strong. And we have to choose to pursue these holy things. And when we do so, two things you're going to see today. When we choose to do that, I believe two things happen. One, we protect ourselves from the things of this world that we already read about. That's the first thing. And the second thing that we'll see when we do this, when we instead pursue this holy, righteous living that we're called to, we can even help others see the light of Christ. But before we do that, before we jump into our passage, I need your help, okay? And I need your help in praying with me this morning. I want God to come in and really teach us all this morning. So would you join me for just a quick word of prayers before we jump into our passage this morning? Jesus, you said in your word in Corinthians that the, the goal of instruction, the, the reason why we teach, the reason why we take your word and we, and we bring it forth this morning and, and open it up, you said that the reason that we do that is love. We do that to help us love you better and to love others. As we've heard, it, it, we don't have the choice. That is what we are called to do because you do it. You love. Father, I want to ask that the Holy Spirit this morning would come and speak through me, that every word that comes out of my mouth would be yours, that the Holy Spirit would teach us this morning, and that the Holy Spirit that is in the lives of the people in this room would receive it, that, that would continue prompting us, equipping us. And, and Father, for everyone else, Father, I pray that the Holy Spirit would speak to everybody in this room, that they may hear this word of yours, and it would help draw them closer to you, help take one step closer in understanding the depths of who you are. May we leave here changed and encouraged by, by simply allowing the Holy Spirit to teach us and change us. And to that end, all people said... Amen. Okay, well, hey, uh, I was here a few weeks ago, and uh, when I spoke, I, I took you all, for those of you who are here, I took you on a virtual field trip to Africa. You may remember this, and I'd like to ask if you'd like to go again. Who would like to go on a virtual field trip to Africa? Okay, that's the best I can do. I'd love to take you there physically, but today I, I want to I take us back. Um, I, we're going to go back to the African country of Uganda, but we're going to go to a different city, and we're going to meet a different person for a different reason. Uh, we're going to go to the city of Kampala. Kampala, Uganda is about over 7 million people and growing. It's massive. It's a huge city. Uh, and I want to introduce you to my good friend, Calvin, okay? This is my friend Calvin that I met. So I met Calvin about two and a half years ago on our first new city trip to Uganda. A small team of us went, and it was an amazing trip, okay? Um, the interesting thing is I met Calvin my last day in Uganda, okay? We, we, I literally met this guy about three to four hours before I got onto a plane to come back home, right? It wasn't, that's not when we wanted to meet, but it's the only time we could. We had spent the entire week visiting partners, uh, seeing all of our East African partners and seeing the amazing ministry they were doing. But one of the partners, Wilson from All Nation, the only time he could meet was, was this day. And so we said, of course, yeah, we, we definitely want to come see your work. And he says, well, I, I got some place that I want to take you, all right? Now, keep in mind, it's our first time. First time in Uganda, first time visiting the partner, I have no idea what to expect. And I certainly had no idea where he was about to take us, okay? And that place that he took us to was the largest ghetto in the entire city, okay? Now, there's, there's a lot that I could say about it, but the ghettos in, in Kampala, there's quite a few of them, but... There's, there's the things that we instantly think about, right? If you've ever been into a ghetto, if you've ever been into these areas, there, of course, is the, the, the first issue that you see, which is extreme abject physical poverty, okay? Keep in mind that in order to get to this ghetto, we couldn't actually drive to it, okay? The roads within the ghetto are so bad, they're so terrible, they're so dangerous that you can't actually drive your car. And instead, what we had to do, we had to park on the outskirts, and then we walk into this area, okay? But... Keep in mind, right, that within this ghetto is some of the highest crime rates in the entire city, drug use, drug trafficking, human trafficking, just to name a few. And our guy, Wilson, says, hey, I want to take you there. <laughs> okay? I had no idea. I didn't see a policeman the entire time we're there. Um, it is a very, very dark place, as you can imagine. 
all right? Where even people that aren't engaged in this stuff are suffering as a result. But here's the thing. Despite the overwhelming amount of darkness that, that exists in a place like this, with all, with all the poverty, abject poverty that's happening, with all these other criminal activity that's happening, there is small glimpses of hope. There are small gatherings where the presence of Jesus is, is flickering. And one of those small flickers of light is a group, is a small church of around 15 people that Calvin has gathered weekly. And I want to show you a picture here, right? This is, this is Calvin and his church here, okay? Now, um, the picture, of course, doesn't do it full justice here. I don't know what fountain of honor means. I don't know what supreme leader <laughs> means. I didn't ask while we are there. Um, but this is a really special and amazing group here because when we, when we made the trek in there, we, we walk for about 30 minutes, we come to this, this building, we meet Calvin, and what Calvin and this group have done, and they've taken basically what was kind of like an old art studio in the middle of the ghetto, and they've now flipped it, and it's now a weekly gathering for Christians to come together. And, and I'll never forget this day. It was a powerful day because Calvin, of course, we, we meet him. We hear his story, which is an amazing in and of itself. But one of the things that Calvin did is he said, hey, I'd like to invite any one of you in here uh, if you would like to share your story, a five to ten minute testimony. And I'll never forget this because every single person that you see in that photo shared for about five to ten minutes. Each of them had this amazing testimony where they were open and honest, and they talked about how each of them ha had been involved. Maybe it was in drug use or drug trafficking, sexual immorality, you name it. Each of them shared these dark things about their past. And yet the beautiful thing is, because of a guy like Calvin, who had the, the, the faith, the, the courage to walk into a place like this and start sharing because of relationship and just consistently showing up week in and week out, he has now gathered this group of people, and each one of those people in this picture have now given their life to Christ as a result. You'll see on this next picture here, here I want you to see something about this picture, okay? You notice the expressions? You see, these are not the faces of people who are controlled by the forces of evil. I got out my phone, y'all, and I have like 30,000 pictures with these guys. Right, they were so happy. They wanted to take pictures. I, I took pictures of each of them individually. They were so thrilled. They were, sh they were thrilled to share their story. But I, but I look at a picture like this, and, and I'm just reminded of what happens when, when the presence of Christ enters into a dark realm, into a reality, that these guys, to my knowledge, are still there. They're still living in this, in this really difficult arena in, in this huge ghetto here. And yet, they, they continue to battle all these forces around them, and yet, that's who they are. They're choosing every week to gather and, and encourage one another with the scripture, and through singing, through opening God's word. Their lives exude the presence of Christ. Now, I, I share this story with you, because what I, what I want to invite us to do this morning, I, I just want to start with a simple question that I want you to put in your head. What happens when you throw a small light into a dark place? What would happen if you threw a, even just a small flicker of light into a dark arena, especially an arena that's opposed to it? Here, here's, here's a couple things that I know. Like, let's, let's take the example, right? Take a, take a small candle and let's put it in the middle of a dark forest, right? We know a few things will happen. One, if you place the dark candle in the middle of the forest, it's gonna have to battle the elements against it, right? Everything is opposed to the light, right? Consider, the wind is going to try to blow it out. The rain will try to quench it, to, to extinguish it, right? Animals, everything else may come over and knock it over. There's so much against the candle, and of course, if it doesn't get refueled, it will eventually go out. But here's the other thing that we know about a small light. When you place it in a dark place, is that the light does become attractive, by its very nature, it is attractive. Regardless of what someone thinks of the light, it's nonetheless attractive, right? Animals, bugs, right? Just do this in your backyard tonight. You'll see things will start flocking towards it because things are drawn to the light. 
And I think the passage that, that we've read this morning that we're going to continue work, working through helps us understand a very similar reality about who we are as individuals, as, as people who are choosing to say, I want to follow Christ. And I want, to, I want to display the light of Christ, the hope of Christ in an otherwise dark world, right? We're going to see why it's so important that we understand the world we live in and why it is so important that we reject the darkness. That instead what we're going to pursue is the light and we're going to help others do the same. So with that being said, let's go back to Romans 13. If, you, if, you don't, if you're not there already, I invite you, open up your copy of scripture, your phone, physical copy, whatever. Or if you need the New City app, we also have it on our New City app where we'll have the passes over there. But I want to begin in verses 11 and 12 here. So turn with me, look again. Romans 13, let's look at verses 11 through 12 again. Paul says this, this is all the more urgent, for you know how late it is. Time is running out. Wake up, for our salvation is nearer now than we first believed. The night is almost gone. The day of salvation will soon be here. Now, that's talk about a way to start out a passage this morning, right? Talk about some strong, stern language that, that we're going to begin with. And we're going to unpack this, but we got to go kind of phase by phase here, right? Paul is giving us this really, really strong imperative. But, but notice the phrase here that he begins with. He says, this is, all right? So our first question is, we're going to unpack scripture together today. We've got to ask the question here, what, what is this, what, what is he referring to? What is this referring to, right? Well, okay, if you remember, if you know, when you study scripture, uh, scripture is kind of like real estate. In real estate, the most important thing is location, location, and location. And in studying scripture, doing an inductive study of scripture, the most important things in that is context, context, and then there's one more, context, right? We have, it, that's where we have to start when we unpack scripture together. And so we're going to do the same thing here. Now, there's a little bit of nuance here. So when Paul says this is, we, we're, we're asking, okay, what is this? What is he referring to? Now, it's possible that what Paul's referring to when he says this is, is that he could be referring to verses 8 and 10, that obligation to love. Right? That's possible. However, I think in the greater context, when we look at the verses after and prior, if we put it into a bigger context, here's what I think Paul is saying. I think Paul is, is saying, hey, let's stop for a moment. Let's consider everything I've said since chapter 12. Okay? When he begins that, that statement, we, let us be transformed by the renewing of our mind. Let us become holy living sacrifices. Everything past that that we've looked to, I think, leads us to this statement, which is this is. He said, let's take all of that together and consider something. So it might, perhaps if we were to rephrase it, it might read something like this. Being a holy and living sacrifice, it is all the more urgent, right? So in other words, because you are called to do these things, it is all the more urgent. But regardless, here's what we know for sure. As he moves from this, he says, this is more important. This is all the more urgent. Notice here, he gives us this, this extremely piercing notion where he says, we are to be ready. Notice the language he uses. He says, time is running out. Salvation is near. Wake up. Now, again, what is he referring to here? Well, to answer that question, we can actually look at, go back to what Christ himself talked about, right? And when, when we look at the Gospels, this phrase, this, this idea of, you know, wake up, the time is near, it's actually pretty common throughout the New Testament because the authors and Jesus spoke about it multiple times. Jesus in the Gospels talked about there is a day that is coming, all right? A day that would come after his death and resurrection, right? He, he spoke of this day often, a, a literal day that will come when, when Christ will return. Now, we as believers, we, we don't know when that day is. Christ himself said, I don't even know when that's going to be. Paul acknowledged, I don't know when that's going to be, but he says, there is this thing called the day, this really special time that will happen. But until then, what Paul is giving us here is he, he's giving us a reminder and he's saying, hey, we need to, there's a call to action here. He says, wake up. You need to be aware of this. You need to be conscious of these things in your life. You need to be in tune with what's happening in the world around you. Because what he's saying is he says, change is coming. Change is coming. Remember that this morning, okay? There is a time 
where Paul calls it here, a time of salvation where all those who know Christ will be gathered together. We will live eternally in his presence. A time is coming where the, the evils of darkness will be expelled. Change is coming, but it's not yet. It's not right now, okay? We still live in a world of darkness, a world that is consumed on that. We're going to talk about that more in a moment. But again, he gives us this present reality. He says, wake up. We need to be aware. Now, I, I want to be careful, though, because even in my tone or just even reading this, it's, it's easy to hear this and, and, and be consumed with perhaps maybe a level of trepidation or fear that's not biblical, okay? And here's what I mean by this is um, it, we can let our faith in God become in, infected with an ungodly fear. Um, and what I want to encourage you with today is that when we understand what pure biblical fear is, there's a huge difference between that and worldly human broken fear that we often suffer with from time to time. Fear of God for the believer is not to be scared or in trepidation. No, it's to be in awe and have respect. But much like in the Chronicles of Narnia, remember, you remember this great phrase when they, when they asked the beaver, they're like, hey, is uh, you know, the, that, that guy Aslan the lion, is he safe? And they go, no, of course he's not safe. There's nothing safe about him, but he's good. The same thing that Paul's getting us here. He's like, we can, be, we can have complete awe and respect and admiration for the power and the majesty of God, but that doesn't mean that we should be hiding under the rock fearful. In fact, what I would argue from this passage is that it's actually an encouragement. It's actually there to remind us of, of the great wholesome truth of Scripture because when we're rooted in truth, when we know what Scripture says, when we take the promises of Jesus, we take the promises of the New Testament, we're not, we're not consumed with human worry or fear and anxiety. No. Remember what Paul said? Perfect love casts out fear. There's no place for it. That's not what we're called to live in. No. When we are rooted in the, in the truth of Scripture, we find security in, a day, in knowing this. We, it is of joy knowing that there is a day coming when Christ will come back. There is security and, and joy knowing that one day Jesus will come back. Paul is, is giving us this reminder. He says, don't, don't forget all that Jesus has done for you, but equally, don't forget all that he's going to do for you. The story's not done, y'all. There's more to be written. The best is literally yet to come, okay? Amen. Amen. Paul is telling us, don't forget all this. Don't abandon your call to holy living. Don't forget the trans, the, what's happened with our minds, the renewal there. Don't forget these things. Don't forsake all that. But live with joy. Live with joy knowing that one day it will come to this beautiful place. Let's continue here. Verses 12 and 13, okay? Paul writes on. He says, so, as a result of all this, he says, remove your dark deeds like dirty clothes and put on the shining armor of right living. Because we belong to the day... We must live decent lives for all to see. Don't participate in, in the darkness of wild parties and drunkenness or sexual promiscuity and immoral living or in quarreling and jealousy. We go from one really strong phrase, command, straight into another. You can never accuse Paul of mincing his words. He goes straight for it. He, he leaves no room there for us to interpret that otherwise. He says we need to abandon those things, right? Now, this section is really dealing with kind of two words, two realities. Paul's using the analogy of day and light, or a day and darkness, okay? So we, we've kind of introduced the idea of what the day is. It's, it's, it's kind of two-part, actually. It's, it is referring to a, a future day that will come where Christ returns and we will be gathered together. And, and he's also painting this picture where, the, where daytime, the light, is associated with what goodness is, okay? But Jesus talked a little bit more about this day. In fact, in John 14, you may remember this passage when, he, when he's talking to the disciples, um, you remember in John 4, or 14, verses 1 through 4, Jesus said, Don't let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God and trust also in me. There is more than enough room in my Father's house. If this were not so, would I have told you that I'm going to prepare a place for you? Notice this. When everything is ready, I'll come get you. And you will be with me always where I am. And you know the way to where I am going. Talk about a day. 
guys, the time is coming. We get to go home. This is not the end. There's something. Uh, Jesus is literally right now preparing a place for those who know him. And one day he's coming back. We get to go home. That day, the day is beautiful. To be in the light that Paul's painting here is, is to be within Christ, to, to understand the truth and the goodness of, that comes with the light. But, of course, there's the other part. The contrast to the light is the darkness. The darkness, as Paul starts to paint for us, is, is much different. The darkness is not a future event. It's a present reality. There's nothing life-giving about the darkness. In fact, what, what Paul equates to the darkness, what he's painting here, he says that the darkness is actually in complete opposition to the day. It's in complete opposition to what is associated with the goodness of God and life and life-giving, all that. He says that the darkness is in complete opposition. But notice what he tells us here about it. He gives us yet another command, another thing for us to be aware of. Notice as he says, we need to remove the darkness. We need to remove the dark deeds, the things that are unholy, the sin in our lives, the things that I'm guilty of, the things that you're guilty of. Every day we have to be aware of this. He says, imagine it like dirty clothes. We need to take it off, right? Tammy made the joke, right? I mean, how many of you have walked out just from the grocery store to your car and you're already sweaty? Right, last night, we're outside playing soccer. It's outside for like four or five hours last night. It was amazing. It was fun with all the, playing with a bunch of kids. Uh, guys, I could, I could like, I got home and I could just scrape the salt off me, right? You know, you know what I'm talking about when I say that, right? You get so hot and humid, right? And Paul says, that's how we kind of need to look at sin. We need to look at it as something nasty and gross. And, and we want nothing more than to just hop in the shower, get rid of all of it. He says, that's how we have to look at the dark deeds of our lives, they have no place on us. We need to get rid of them, right? Sin is a nasty, vicious stain, right? And then look, look again. He, he expands upon it. He says, let me give you some examples. He goes, don't participate in things associated with the darkness, right? Things that he, he's, he's saying a lot of this stuff happens in the nighttime, not necessarily, but it, but it certainly does a lot of times. Notice what he lists here. He says, don't participate in things like wild parties, drunkenness, sexual promiscuity, immoral living, quarreling with others, jealousy. Well, good thing we have none of that today. Look, it, the Bible may be over 2,000 years old, but I promise you it's just as relevant. <laughs> I, I, I want us to consider for a moment, you look at this list, right, wild parties, drunkenness, etc. How many wild, drunken parties happened in our city last night? How many crazy things happened in our, in our city and in our world? How many, how many people were hurt last night because of something like this? I'll be a little vulnerable with you this morning. Take it from somebody who was a wild, drunken partier. Nothing good ever comes from these things. Zero. It is impossible. It has never happened. And I will, I will argue with anybody all day. Zero good comes from something like this. I've seen more friends go to the hospital, get hurt, abuse, you name it. I've seen more of that stuff happen at stuff like this than I care to ever remember. Consider, consider just the, the darkness of our world, right? We have these things going on. Sexual promiscuity and freedom may be worse than it's ever been. Pornography industry is valued at $1.2 billion, 5% increase from last year. Divorce rates are declining, which I thought was interesting until I realized that's only because marriages are declining. Less and less people are becoming married. Sexual freedom, um, the number of sexual partners or body count as it's called today is now a badge of honor. Lifestyle acceptance of any nature is now equated with compassion. Identities are, are found in gender and politics and philosophy and, and not in our creator. Listen, the world is dark. I hate to paint this picture, but it's the reality. In fact, Paul in Ephesians, he gives us an even darker reality. And by the way, hang in there. I promise it gets better. <laughs> Just hang with me for a minute, okay? Look at Ephesians chapter 2. 
Paul wrote this. He says, once you were dead because of your disobedience and your many sins, you used to live in sin like the rest of the world. Notice this, though. He says, obeying the devil, the commander of the powers in the unseen world, he is the spirit at work in the hearts of those who refuse to obey God. Notice here, Paul says we have a personal individual battle that we are dealing with where we have to remove the dark things of life like dirty clothes, get them off. But then he says in Ephesians, he reminds us that there's, it's even worse than that, right? He, he, he tells us that there's an enemy at work. There's an enemy who would love nothing more to destroy you, right? Um, and Peter, Peter said that, that, that our adversary, the devil, is like a lion. He walks around and he creeps around and he looks for an opportunity to pounce on people, Right? We, we are in a dark world controlled by the, by the force of evil itself. But hang in there. I promise you, as, as hard as this is to talk about, as, as, as dark as things may feel right now, I promise you, good is coming. And it's not me. It's, it's scripture. God is not done here, okay? We as believers have been called to live this transformed life, to, to reject the darkness from our lives. We Listen, we don't have a choice, all right? Just as we are called to love and, and, and we have the obligation to love, listen, if, if we know Christ, we are called to reject the things of darkness. And I'm not perfect at it, and I don't expect any of you to be either. But nonetheless, it is our pursuit. But here's the good news, okay? Again, don't let fear rule you. The Bible tells us that in Christ through love, perfect love casts out fear. There is no room for that. And just as it, it, so as it dark as it may be to read these verses and to consider the reality that we're in, remember, yes, you have an adversary, but also remember this, you have an advocate. And I assure you this, he who is in you is much greater than he who is in the world. The advocate, the Holy Spirit, is far more powerful than the commander of the world right now. I can assure you that. And here's how I know. Look at verse 14. Paul wraps this up and he says this. Instead, instead, clothe yourself with the presence of the Lord Jesus and don't let yourself think about ways to indulge your sinful desires. I love that phrase. And I've been, trying to th I've been thinking through it all week. What does that mean? What does it mean that we clothe ourselves with the presence of Christ? You know, each of us in this room this morning, we, we, we made a choice, and some value perhaps more than others, but we, each of us chose what we, what we wore today. We picked out our outfit. Um, to some degree uh, or less, we, we value what people perceive of us and how we're dressed and what we're wearing, and that's not a bad thing, by the way. But here's what I want to challenge us all to think about today is, as important as our, as our actual physical clothes may be, I wonder what it would be like for people to not be interested in what you're physically wearing, but what they're experiencing from you in your presence. What, what could people possibly benefit from? What are you exuding from yourself that makes you unique and opposed to the world? You know, as, I, as I've thought about this, this phrase, what does it mean to put on the presence of Christ? It's, it's almost kind of poetic, isn't it? We go from these really stern, strong passages where Paul says, you know, Get rid of these things, be away, get ready, all these things. And then he, he brings us to verse 14, and it's, and it's almost this kind of beautiful poetic thing. He says, but instead, clothe yourself with Christ. A, a, a more kind of um, beautiful expression of how, what the Christian life is all about, that we put on the person of Christ. And, and, I, and I started to list out this week, I, I said, what does it mean for me to clothe myself in Christ? And, and here was the things I wrote. I, to me, it means to have faith. It's every day. It's every day saying, God, I don't know what's ahead, but I'm trusting you. It means to remember the gospel every day. It means to remember that I'm a sinner. There's nothing I could do to ever repay my debt, and Christ died on the cross for me. Every day, that's what clothing myself with Christ means. Like It means to be like him, to pursue him. It means to repent of sins. It means to hold fast to his promises. It means to love others. It means to never be ashamed of the gospel. It means to not live in fear, but of hope. It means to have joy and peace and freedom. And it means to care so deeply about others in this world that I want them to, to leave the darkness as I have, even though I battle it every day. One author I read, I thought, 
did, did a really good summary, and I, and I want you to consider this this morning. He said, we are clothed in Christ. In other words, we put on the presence of Christ when we become so closely united with Jesus that others see him and not us. I'll say that again. We are clothed in Christ when we become so closely united in Jesus that others see him and not us. Guys, that's what I want to strive for this morning. That's what I want for you. That's what I want for all of us, for all people in this world that know Christ, that, that have been transformed by the renewal, of the, by the message of the gospel, that are saying, I want to be a holy and living sacrifice. That's what I want to be. I want to be that person that says there is something unique about him. I, I want to be so in tune and in touch and united with Christ that people experience him through me. And the good news of the gospel, the good news of our relationship with Christ is God says, and I'll do it for you. All I ask is one thing, and that is trust. Some of you may have heard this great phrase or quote before, but um, as we talk about the importance of, of choosing to clothe ourselves in the presence of Christ and what that means not only for ourselves but for our world, uh, you know, one of the great quotes that I've heard before is that you may be the only Bible someone ever reads. And I've always liked that phrase, right? I've always enjoyed that, that you may encounter people who uh, they couldn't tell you where the book of Genesis is. They know nothing about this book, but perhaps, maybe, just maybe, they could read you. They would see something in your life that could take what's true and the, the, the truth of this word and then receive it. But I also wonder, or I also thought of, you know, you may be the only Bible someone reads. You also may be the only impression of Jesus someone ever has. And I can tell you in our world today, most people that I encounter in our world, they know a little of this. It's pretty distorted. They may know a little of this. They may know a little bit of the person of Jesus, but what they often almost always have is a distorted view. And I wonder what it would look like for someone to be clothed in the presence of Christ that they would feel that, right? I go back to Calvin, all right? I, I consider Calvin again, and, and I look at a young guy. By the way, he's 23 years old. I look at a young guy like that, Calvin is clothed in the presence of Jesus. And because he has the courage and the faith, he has helped be that candle in the darkness. And here's what I want to encourage you with today is that you can too. God has given you the ability to have that faith, to clothe yourself in the presence of God, not only to protect yourself, but to draw others to him. I'll, I'll end with one quick story here. So some of you know, um, you may not be aware, um, but when I can, I volunteer my time. I'm a chaplain for the Charlotte Police Department. And uh, I don't get to do as much as I used to, but I'll never forget um, a story about five years ago, five, six years ago. Um, I, was, I was in a ride-along. I was, I was riding along with one of the officers I knew, sitting in the car. It was the middle of the afternoon, and, and a, level, like a, a level one call comes in, which is like the most important. Um, there was a report came in that a young girl was trying to commit suicide, okay, which is like you drop everything and you go, right? So we get the call, we race over there, and we're actually like the last ones to show up on scene. And so I, I come up onto the scene, and there's about six or seven squad cars for probably about 10 police officers. There's two fire trucks. There's a paramedic. There's all these people, and they're there for this one girl who's sitting on her porch just crying and weeping. And, you know, I don't know if you've ever felt this, but, you know, there's been times in my life where I, I walk into something and you just feel the darkness. Have you ever felt that before? Where you can just feel something's right, and that's exactly how I felt. And I'm sitting there on the edges, and I'm seeing this girl, and, and you know, of course, the, the first responders are doing their job, and by the way, they did it extremely well, um, but their job was to make sure she didn't do it. That's all. That's, that's all they're called to do. And they, and they were trying to get her to come into the ambulance so they could take her to the hospital for checkup and all that. And she was having none of it. She was not going to do it. And, and they wanted to, their, their desire was they didn't want to have to yank her out. They didn't want to have to go physically grab her and do that because, again, she's just a young child. And so as I'm sitting there and I'm watching this, I'm asking the Holy Spirit, oh, what do I do here? And at that moment, I, I feel the prompting of the Holy Spirit to say, I want you to go talk to her. What do I say? 
what do I do? So I go up to one of the officers and I say, hey, can I, can I give it a shot? And they're like, yeah, go for it. Um, I'll never forget this moment. Um, I walk up and um, I briefly make eye to- contact with this girl. And I smile at her. She gives me a half-attempted smile. And I say, hey, is it okay if I sit right here with you? She's on the porch. And she's like, yeah. And she just kind of didn't really care at that point. Um, and I begin talking with her. And I start asking her, I'm like, hey, what's, what's going on? Can you tell me a little bit? What's, and she didn't want to talk about it. I said, okay, okay, fine. I understood that. So I broke out my phone. And uh, I started showing her pictures of my dog and just silly things, right? Just trying to win that trust. And just try to be a presence of calm and good in an otherwise extremely chaotic situation. And as we're talking, I realize uh, something happened that helped me realize one of the reasons why she felt this way. Her grandmother comes out. She's yelling at her. She's like, don't you do this on my porch, and you don't have the guts to do it anyway, and all this horrible stuff. I'm, now, I'm just as sad as I am mad now. I want to yell at the grandmother and all these things, but God, just stay here. Sit right here. We go on and we talk for about another 20 minutes. And I just, she starts to open up. Maybe because for the first time in her life, somebody actually cared. Maybe for the first time in her life, somebody was actually genuinely interested in her. And she starts telling me, um, you know, she's 15. She goes to this high school and she's, you know, I'm asking her, what does she like to be involved? And she's like, oh, I really love track. I love track and field. And I want to do all this and all these things. And um, it was a really difficult moment. And it, it's, it's hard for me to tell this story even now, years later. But at one point, I finally, I felt the urge again. I said, can you, so what's going on here? And, and her, her answer was not all that surprising. She's like, I just can't do this anymore. I can't live here. I can't be around my grandmother. I can't do all these things. And I said, that's understandable. I said, I, you know, I can't imagine what that's like. I, I have no idea. But here's a couple of things that I do know. Is I've shared a little bit of my life with you right now, and you're now my friend. And you're valued. And I shared scripture with her. I shared what God thinks of her. And you, you begin to see the heart soften a little bit. And eventually she, she said, so what's, what's going to happen here? And I said, well... Here's what's going to happen. I said, because of this is just what's required, you have to go to the hospital. That's just just how it's going to be. Now, here's what I would encourage you to do, though. I said, you see all these first responders out here? They actually don't want to cause you any more harm either. And the last thing that they want to do is come grab you and force you in. I said, wouldn't it be amazing if you could show to yourself, to everyone around you, that you have the courage and the faith to stand up on your own two feet and walk there? And that's exactly what she did. Now, listen, I I don't know what happened to this girl long term. I didn't get to go to the hospital. We didn't talk about all that. Um, Here's why I share that story is because I I can take no credit for it. All I can can do is simply give you an illustration of what happens when you place a small light into a dark place. If you're here this morning and you know Christ personally, I promise you, you have the ability to be that light. You have the ability to to be a small light, even in a dark place, and I'm telling you, the world needs it. Maybe it's your family, maybe it's uh, coworkers, whatever it may be, you have the ability to do that, and the world needs it. That's our bottom line for this morning, by the way, is that in a world that is consumed and trapped in darkness, Let's show others the path of freedom that is found through Christ. Let's pray this morning. Jesus, there, you, you use this analogy often of, of being the light. Um, we, we read in John 1, you were the, the light of the world that came into darkness. The darkness couldn't even comprehend it. And you said you want us to be that. But to do so, Jesus, we have to, we have to reject the darkness. We have to get rid of it. There's no place in it. But we can't do it on our own. The good news is you didn't. You say well, you, we don't have to. You said trust in me. Let me help you expel it. Let me cover you in my presence. 
so that you may reject that and share the love of Christ. And that's our prayer.